Hello, I'm Jerry Shatton. And again, it's a pleasure to join you. And I'm grateful to all of our colleagues and friends at Almer for the generous invitation. I'm going to speak about the role of the sperm uh, in abnormal, whoops, oops, I want to go into pointer, in abnormal fertilization today. And you can see here in this image that some, this sperm, or perhaps this one is getting in, but many of the others are not. And this is an important and a complicated field. And there are many different aspects of the sperm any which any one of which can render it non-functional and thereby cause male infertility you know that when the sperm touches the egg it sets off a wave of calcium that activates the egg and now there are methods using calcium ionophore to activate eggs artificially if the penetrating sperm did not activate the egg. These methods are highly experimental. We don't really know whether there will be long-term consequences of ionophores in the embryo or later on. I think if it's important, there will be ways to improve on this technique. But I want you to be aware that there are ways if a sperm doesn't activate the calcium wave to bypass it. In addition to activating the, um, the, the, the fire that starts the egg cytoplasm, you'll remember that the sperm also brings in the two centrioles. And there are many forms of male infertility that are caused by defects in the centrioles, but they only appear after the sperm has entered the egg. So this is an egg which had been declared one that had failed to fertilize. And yet by high resolution imaging, we can see in fact the sperm entered. There's a sperm tail here, but the centriole never or organized the microtubule array necessary to bring the sperm and egg nuclei together. Here is another one where the microtubule started to form, but it failed. And there is a truncated sperm aster, as well as the inactivated meiotic spindle from the female. Here's another one where the sperm aster has detached inappropriately from the sperm and egg nuclei. All of these have been dis dismissed as fertilization failures, and they are failures, but they're failures after the sperm has entered the egg. Interestingly, there are mutations in Drosophila or the worm C. elegans that mimic these exact events. And so there will be ways to understand the genetic causes of these different forms of male infertility. I mentioned to you that there's a series of steps. There's sort of a choreography that the sperm must undergo before it gets into the egg and activates the egg. And any problem in that choreography and that dance will lead to fertilization failure and potentially infertility. So remember, normally a sperm will undergo capacitation, the acrosome reaction, then the sperm will bind to the membrane of the egg, it will be incorporated into the egg, and then the egg will be activated and other events will occur, leading eventually to the genomic union of the sperm and the egg nuclei, which only really occurs at first mitosis, and then the egg dividing. Intratid intracytoplasmic sperm injection, this amazing technique where you can inject a sperm directly into the egg cytoplasm, circumvents many of the early events of fertilization. But if you think of fertilization like a a, a race with hurdles, you're jumping across some hurdles, but you're not jumping across all of them. So there are cases, even after the sperm is injected, where fertilization will lock up and they are locking up because of defects in the sperm. And furthermore, the behavior of the sperm after ICSI is very different than the behavior of sperm 
during natural fertilization. Sperm have a sort of a, a necktie around their equator. And these neckties normally come off as the sperm fuses with the egg membrane. So if this goes into the egg, it would normally come off. They also have a skull cap, um, what we Jews would call a, 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 a yarmulke. Um, but um, a skull cap that normally is lost at the egg surface, or kippa. Um, but after injecting it into the egg, the sperm keeps the structure on and it stays on until first uh, DNA synthesis starts. Here you can see a structure that um, restricts the swelling of the nucleus. Ironically, the X or the Y chromosome are in the apex of the sperm head. And we think that may be a reason why there is some sex chromosome anomalies after ICSI. We're learning a lot about the centriole. As I mentioned, the centriole is a lot like uh, Lego pieces. And you know, if you have Legos, you have lots of different pieces and you can assemble them, but you assemble them with certain rules that allow them to form in certain patterns. And in this case, it's a 90 degree orthogonal pattern with a ninefold symmetry. And this is found in centrioles all throughout nature every place on earth. And it's one of the arguments as to why we are convinced that life arose once and only once here on earth. And it will be fascinating to see if we find life on Mars. So let me tell you that normally there are events on the egg surface which select the, the optimal sperm from all the others so that this one becomes the sperm which parents, which is the paternal contribution to the baby. With ICSI, we look down the microscope and we go, oh, that's a cute, I, I like that sperm. And we pick a cute sperm. It's totally capricious. It's, we have no criteria to decide which of these sperm to pick. And someone looks down a microscope and says, oh, that's gonna be daddy. And we should have better understandings. Furthermore, we did some experiments to show that if there's foreign DNA on the outside of the sperm, it is not incorporated into an egg during fertilization. It's as if I had mud on my jacket and if I took it off, the mud would be left outside of the egg. In contrast, during ICSI, the foreign particle is injected into the egg cytoplasm and if it's a virus, it will replicate in the fertilized egg. We call this immaculate infection. It's not immaculate conception, it's the infection that you can get. Never mind, I won't push it. Um, now, there's this enormous field growing, which is called the genetics of male infertility. And it's amazing that we can't even talk about the genetics of infertility. So I went to Berkeley when everybody was rioting there in the 1960s. And we were told that if your grandparents didn't have children and your parents didn't have children, well, at least statistically speaking, you wouldn't have children. That was the genetics of infertility, right? You're not supposed to be able to pass on a trait that causes infertility. And it's amazing to me that we now have a field about male infertility, and it's because of the advent of ICSI. But I want to digress for a minute and tell you about our new world and how different we are from the old world in many ways, including the fathers of North America and South America. There's excellent evidence that George Washington was offered the kingship. He never had children. He married Martha, who was a divorced mom with two children. He never adopted her children, but did adopt her grandchildren. It appears that he was a very healthy heterosexual. And he wrote, and I'll show you that in a few moments, about how saddened he was not to have biological heirs. 
Would he have wanted to be king were it not for his male infertility? Simon Bolivar, El Libertador, I think I'm pronouncing that badly. The great man in South America who fought the Spanish had a very healthy sexual appetite. Um, and I believe it was um, strictly heterosexual, but I don't want to go there. But he had a healthy appetite and never had any children. He lost his first wife very young, but he knew that he was not conceiving children. And perhaps that's one of the reasons that, oh, I'm not supposed to use um, obscenities, even ones in Spanish, so I'll leave that alone. But so he had no children, maybe because of infertility, but he might also have been interested in being a king rather than founding a republic if he had biological heirs. And so could the history of the entire new world be been very different had both of our leaders ironically suffered from male infertility? Um, with George Washington, um, it may well be that he suffered from tuberculosis, um, and, um, and he never lost sight of wanting to have children. From his writings, it's clear that Washington desired a child as an heir. This in combination uh, with his relationship with a fertile partner makes it likely that Washington suffered from male infertility. So let me tell you about ICSI. With ICSI, as I said, someone looks down a microscope, takes a polished needle and aspirates a sperm into the lumen of the needle. Then with a holding pipette, the egg is held by the suction pipette and the sperm is introduced right into the egg cytoplasm, typically at nine or three o'clock away from the meiotic spindle. The meiotic spindle finishes its work leading to the second polar body nucleus and the egg nucleus, and the egg nucleus migrates down these microtubules to reach the sperm nucleus as these um, unusual acrosome reacted uh, uh, molecules come off in the egg cytoplasm. Then the sperm and egg nuclei come together and the egg begins its preparation for first mitosis. Now, as I said, the sperm does not undergo an acrosome reaction in ICSI. Instead, it is injected into the egg cytoplasm with all the hydrolytic enzymes that are in the acrosome as well as the periacrosomal theca, a structure that restricts the swelling of the sperm nucleus. There's a new nuclear envelope that's placed on the sperm after it's in the egg, leading to the formation of the male pronucleus. And normally, these have nuclear pores inserted in them. But after ICSI, they are assembled in a, um, a, a discoordinated, um, retarded fashion. There are structures of preformed nuclear envelopes called annual lamellae that are present in unfertilized eggs. And these serve as the reservoirs to make more nuclear envelopes. Remarkably, one of the proteins in this is responsible for this extremely rare disease of progeria. This is a disease of advanced aging. The children of progeria rarely live into their teens. They have unusual phenotypes. It's heartbreaking because they're beloved as any other child. And it's just a small problem with uh, misregulation of the assembly of the nuclear envelope that leads to this physiological and devastating disorder. There, there are some um, avant-garde attempts to try to help people who have children with progeria. Um, God willing, they will have some success 
um, we are learning so much about aging from these individuals. And I so hope that biomedical science can give back to these people who are generously sharing their body tissues as research resources. This is the nuclear envelope forming dynamically. There are annual lamellae that bleb into the nuclear envelope and become part of the nuclear envelope. And there are parts of the nuclear envelope that are under maternal control. And then later, there are parts that are under zygotic or embryonic control. And it's bizarre because we've always thought about the organelles in the cytoplasm, the mitochondria, the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulum, so many organelles that are bound by a membrane. And we're now re realizing that in both the cytoplasm and the nucleus, there are structures that don't have, that do not have a nucleus, I do not have a membrane around them, but they behave like the waxes in a lava lamp. They behave as coacervates, they behave as condensates, and they, the water is less fluid within them than in other parts of the cytoplasm. And these liquid-like domains are transforming our understanding of what happens in the cytoplasm. So you may know that there's the centrosome, there are stress granules, there are other things um, in, the in the cytoplasm. In addition, in the nucleus, there are nuclear pores and speckles. There is the nucleolus. There are nuclear um, bodies like the Cajal body. And these seem to be membraneless proteinaceous organelles. It's a whole new field of cell biology that we didn't appreciate until just a couple of years ago. And these molecules typically condense and then decondense, sort of like a lava lamp where it bubbles up and then comes down and bubbles up and then comes down. And there are some devastating diseases, devastating diseases that occur when they aggregate but don't disaggregate. One of them is Alzheimer's. We have a protein amyloid and also tau, and Alzheimer's seems to be the result of the aggregation and not disaggregation of these proteins. These proteins are in us from our earliest days as gametes, and they normally aggregate and disaggregate. But as we age, they don't get properly destroyed. Synuclein is the culprit in Parkinson's disease. Glutamine is the culprit in Huntington's disorder. And there are other temporal uh, dementias. And these frontotemporal lobal dementias are caused by other microtubule diseases. And if any of you are looking for a new field to go into, Aging on our planet is an epidemic. Baby boomers like me are not dying fast enough. And young people like you are not reproducing fast enough. There is a crisis of young people to take care of old people. And unless we can slow down the rate of Alzheimer's in particular, our planet is going to suffer from an epidemic of the elderly. And that's a whole nother story. So again, sperm have complicated structures and any aspect of the complex structure will lead to infertility. There are some early studies now looking at the semen quality of men who were generated by ICSI. And these early men have three times likely the odds that their sperm concentrations will be lower than the WHO reference values. They're four times more likely to have sperm counts below 40 million. Now, the early men who were treated with ICSI clearly, clearly were treatments for men who suffered from um, male infertility. 
we've relaxed the, um, the uh, eligibility for ICSI over the years. And so perhaps these men will be suffering more from male infertility that's passed on rather than um, the more recently generated ICSI men. But we should keep our eyes on this. I'll spend a minute or two only on centrioles. Many people think that the centrioles are lost in the embryo, but in fact, here we are looking at female primordial germ cells. These are the cells that will give rise to the sperm or the egg in the gonad. So this is the gonad, which is not yet a testis or an ovary. This is the undifferentiated gonad in the fetus. And we can already see nice pairs of centrioles. And these centrioles are brought over into the gonocytes and then into the, um, the early gametes. And remarkably, we can even find centrioles in the first and second meiotic spindle. So we don't really know how does the egg lose its centriole and how does the sperm retain its centriole? And this is a question that was posed over 150 years ago and it still burns brightly with us. And if any of you are interested in further research on this, please let me know, we have spots in the lab. This is the paper. And I mentioned to you that aberrant events in the epididymis lead to aberrant offspring. And indeed, even infections in males can lead to behavioral abnormalities that are transmitted through small RNAs. This is an, a critically important aspect of epigenetics that we are just beginning to understand. And so remember that the sperm brings many things into the egg and we don't understand exactly what the sperm is bringing in and why some conceptions are aberrant. Now, you know there is a field of three parent fertilization where a woman with mutant mitochondrial DNA may get an egg from a healthy donor and you end up with an offspring, one which has a maternal mitochondrial mom, another has a maternal nuclear mom, and then one has the paternal dad. Ostensibly, you end up with an embryo that doesn't have mitochondrial disease. I think these are still very early days for these experiments, and please don't think that we understand mitochondria fully at all, because we don't. And this was the work by John Zhang, um, working at an extraordinary clinic in Guadalajara. And mitochondria are held in unusual fashions. And so the way that we um, have mitochondrial only from our mom is, uh, is not clearly understood. This, this ability to have only uniparental inheritance is, is something quite tricky, but it's strict. And there are some disorders where if you just increase the number of normal mitochondria, you can outweigh statistically the number of mutant mitochondria and end up with viable sperm. So mitochondrial inheritance is a complicated form of inheritance and we do not yet understand the full elements of it and it's a field worthy of further study. Let me also mention that there are mitochondrial proteins that are found at extra mitochondrial locations. So people now talk about mitochondrial proteins that emigrate from mitochondria and end up with dual citizenship, both within the mitochondria and other parts of the body. And um, we can see this by seeing that many human sperm uh, proteins have extra, extra testicular, not terrestrial, extra, terrest extra ter testicular origins, excuse me. <laughs> um, so we really are chimeras in many ways. Things are moving around in complicated fashions. Now, I mentioned aging a little bit. I like this cartoon. Here's this guy getting a semen analysis. And you can see normal sperm look like little tadpoles. And his, unfortunately, have metamorphosed because he's so old. And I won't make jokes about myself on this. But aging and fertility are temporarily correlated. And it appears as if 
your fertility is correlated with your longevity in such a manner that semen analysis from older men can predict their longevity. I don't think life insurance companies yet know this because typically they don't ask for a semen analysis. But if you knew how long you would live, it would be a great information as to whether you should buy life insurance or not. Because if you're gonna to live to be 100 years old, don't pay for the life insurance. You're wasting your money. But if you're gonna to die tomorrow, oh my God, what a great investment. You're gonna die rich, or at least your heirs will be rich. Now I tried to get at the heart of this and there are actually papers on the last remaining eunuchs who were made in Korea. Now, these eunuchs lived a longer time than non-castrated men, but they also were held within the palace and in, a, um, in, a, in a, an unusual environment. And it's amazing to think that eunuchs were still around us um, uh, uh, until just a few years ago. Um, I won't push this one. Um, so exceptional longevity can be correlated both with, usually it's correlated with increased rep reproduction, though at times it can be correlated with de decreased reproduction, but in both men and women, fecundity and longevity seem to be correlated. Now there are ways of cheating the system uh, that causes male infertility. One of them is a method pioneered by my good friend, Kyle Orwig, where you can take testicular biopsies, including from boys before they've undergone cancer therapies, cryopreserve them, wait until after they've grown up, maybe they've gotten their medical degrees in Bogota, and then reintroduce the spermatogonial stem cells and restore their fertility. But God forbid there are one or two cancerous cells here because there's a danger that you could reintroduce the cancer to this man who now was cured. There's another method pioneered by my dear friend, Chaz Easley, who's now in Georgia, where he's able to take stem cells and directly differentiate them into spermatic cells and into um, round spermatids. So there may be ways doing in vitro development to make sperm. There are lots of other factors in sperm that we haven't talked about, but they will be uncovered in the years to come. And so let me end here where you can see some of the salient components in the sperm. All of them are open for further research and we would welcome the opportunity to work with any of you. And let me stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the conference.